coming up on this episode of Photography Online. We explain the pitfalls of using aperture priority, we place your holiday photos under the microscope, and we venture into the wilderness on a quest to get the shot. Welcome to part two of this month's Photography Online, which is once again commercial free. Thanks to all of our supporters who make this possible. Today, we're bringing you the show from our base here on the Isle of Skye here in Scotland, but this will be the last time that we do this for a couple of months, as we'll be on the road for the next few shows. Over the course of some of our recent episodes, we have been myth-busting things such as how focal length doesn't influence the compression of a scene, that sensor size doesn't influence magnification, and that you shouldn't shoot at f22 if you want maximum shot sharpness. Judging from your feedback, many of you have found these features really useful, so we've come up with another similar topic which may be helpful in how you use your camera. There it is, AV or A, the most commonly used shooting mode for many photographers. But why is it so popular when it can lead to exposure errors and takes more time to use properly than full manual mode? Now, before I tell you about the pitfalls of using aperture priority, let's explain what it actually does. It basically puts you, the user, in control of the aperture, the opening and closing of the lens iris, which affects the amount of light coming into the camera. Now, aperture has two influences on the image. Firstly, it influences the exposure. With the larger the aperture, the brighter the exposure. Secondly, it influences depth of field, the distance in front of and behind our plane of focus, which appears sharp. But it isn't actually sharp, something we explained in our May 2020 show, so check that out if you need to brush up on depth of field. These two influences work together, so we can't adjust one without also adjusting the other. However, we can compensate for any changes in exposure by adjusting the exposure time or the ISO by the same value that we change the aperture by. So we tend to think of aperture priority as being a control for depth of field rather than exposure. Using manual mode is far better as it puts us in full control. Let's assume I've got everything set up, including my exposure, but I want to get more depth of field. As you can see, I've got the correct exposure, but I'm at f4, which isn't going to give me enough depth of field to get both the background and the foreground sharp. So I need to close down by three stops to f11 to get the correct depth of field. So one, two, three. So I've now got the correct depth of field, but as you can see, my exposure is way too dark. So I need to compensate for that by either changing the ISO or the exposure time. In this case, I'm going to change the exposure time. One, two, three. So now I've got the correct exposure and the correct depth of field. It's actually very easy. And the more you do this, the more instinctive it will become. And you'll find yourself making such changes without really thinking about them. However, for someone new to photography, then it's understandable that you might want to tackle one setting at a time rather than all of them together. For this reason, many photography tutors and instruction books suggest using aperture priority mode, which is known as a semi-automatic mode because the user has control over the aperture, but the camera has control over the exposure time. In other words, the user is deciding how much of the scene to render sharp by controlling the aperture, but the camera is deciding how bright or dark to make that photo by controlling the exposure time. This allows the user to concentrate solely on depth of field, which can be incredibly useful when getting to grips with all the principles of photography. However, once you have the whole depth of field thing sorted, don't continue to use aperture priority, as you will then be preventing yourself from progressing in your journey of mastering photography, as you won't be in control of the exposure, surely one of the most important elements of any photo. You see, your camera is not as clever as you are, even if you're really stupid, it will make you look like an utter genius. And this is because it has no idea what you're asking it to take a photo of and what tone that subject should be. If you point it at a bright subject, the camera doesn't know that subject should be bright. If you point it at a dark subject, it doesn't know that either. 
Because our cameras are so stupid, they've been told to assume that everything is a mid-tone, exactly halfway between black and white. So when you use an automatic or semi-automatic mode, such as Aperture Priority, you're putting the exposure in the hands of a piece of equipment which has no idea what tone your subject should be. And that cannot be a good thing. We can see this if we use a black and white checkered pattern, similar to a chessboard. Using Aperture Priority mode, let's ask the camera to take a photo of a white square at an aperture of f4. As you can see, the camera, not knowing this should be white, has decided it should be a mid-tone, and because it's in control of the exposure, has recorded the scene as such. Basically, it's totally cocked it up, but to be fair, it's only doing what it's been programmed to do. Now let's ask it to take a photo of a black square, still using the same aperture of f4. As you can see, once again, it's made a right hash of things. But now let's ask it to take a photo of half a white square and half a black square and see what happens. Now, it has detected two different tones and has averaged them out to equal a mid-tone in overall value and as such has got the exposure perfect. This is because I asked the camera to record a scene which is evenly balanced between white and black, but typically this would be shadow and highlight. If we now do the same exercise in manual mode, then white will be white and black will be black, as we've taken away the ability for the camera to make mistakes. If we shoot a landscape using aperture priority mode, it's likely that the scene will be made up of areas of both highlight and shadow, which the camera will then average out to equal a mid-tone. This is all very well, but it assumes a couple of things. Firstly, that your scene contains roughly the same amount of highlight and shadow. And secondly, that you want to record the scene faithfully, which isn't always the case. A silhouette shot, for example, is not a faithful representation of a scene. So even if the camera was clever enough to know what tone your subject is, this still wouldn't be good enough because it cannot read your mind and know exactly how you want to record the image. Now there's something called exposure compensation, which allows the user to force the camera to over or underexpose the scene from that which it originally calculated. So the classic landscape example for when exposure compensation is required is a scene which is covered in fresh white snow. The camera doesn't know it's covered in snow and will attempt to render everything to average out as a mid-tone. This will often result in grey snow, and let's face it, nobody wants that. But by allowing the user to dial in plus one or plus two exposure compensation, it forces the camera to overexpose the scene, which results in the correct exposure. So you might be wondering, well, what's the problem with using aperture priority then? Well, there are two problems. Firstly, once you've got your exposure locked in, either with or without exposure compensation, the camera is still constantly metering the scene. Of course, you've put it in charge of exposure, so it's only trying to keep you happy. So if upon looking at the image on the back of a camera, you now decide that you want to change the composition to include more sky, maybe zoom out a little, or change from landscape to portrait orientation, the camera will detect changes in that scene and will therefore make changes to the exposure. The exposure was correct a moment ago, but now it's totally cocked up again. So you need to make another adjustment to your exposure compensation. This becomes a completely unnecessary and time-wasting task, which just adds to your workflow. This not only increases your chances of missing the moment, but also of messing up the exposure. The second problem is that once you dial in exposure compensation, you need to remember to reset it to zero each time. Otherwise, all your subsequent images will be affected by whatever value you have dialed in. This means that you're making what should be a very simple process a lot more drawn out than it actually needs to be. In manual mode, there is no exposure compensation because, well, there's nothing to compensate for. So we reduce our workflow and make everything far easier. Also, once we've got the exposure locked in, we can change our composition, we can change the orientation of the camera, and the exposure is going to be spot on every single time because we've taken away control from the camera, which, as we've just discovered, regardless of how stupid we are, this is even more stupid. So if you want to truly master exposure, you can't use aperture priority as you are not in full control of the final outcome 
and you create an increased workflow and introduce the chance of making errors by forgetting to reset everything between scenes. Another really important factor is that when you use a camera in aperture priority mode, it automatically compensates for any changes in the ambient light. Now, of course, this can be a good thing because we have to react to those manually in the aptly named manual mode. However, shooting in manual mode encourages the user to pay attention to the changes and the subtleties of light. And it's an awareness of these which will make you a better photographer. If we go around shooting everything in aperture priority all the time, we're probably not paying enough attention to the light. And as photographers, that cannot be a good thing. There are some situations when shooting in aperture priority could be beneficial to you, but landscapes are certainly not one of these. A good example would be, say, if we were doing some street photography and we had a mixture of lighting scenarios in our scene, half the street in sunlight, half the street in shadow, maybe a darkened archway somewhere. We don't know where the action's gonna happen, but yet we have to react super quickly in order to capture the photos. If we're working in manual mode, we may miss a lot of those opportunities. So in this scenario, working in aperture priority mode could be beneficial, but only once we accept that the camera is now in charge of the exposure and it may not get it right every single time. Finally, by using manual mode, not only have you eliminated exposure compensation, but you can completely ignore the camera's exposure meter. And you don't need to worry about which metering mode you have selected, as those are now irrelevant as the camera is not doing the metering, you are. So if you haven't already tried it, why not give manual mode a go and take control of your camera rather than allowing the camera to control your exposures? Now, it may take a while to get your confidence up and you may start off by getting a few under or overexposed shots, but you're gonna learn lessons from these and become a better photographer. You can't possibly learn lessons if the camera's making the mistakes. So take full control and don't allow it to mess up your photos. I hope that was useful and don't forget that all of our essential camera skills information which we covered during our first year is crammed into this 68 page book which is available from our shop along with loads of other things like t-shirts, hats, filters, tripods, just go and take a look. There's a link in the usual place below. Now, if you haven't seen part one of this month's show, then you'll have missed our shootout between the Nikon D850 and the Canon 5DSR to see which one was crowned king of detail. And you'll have also missed our preview to the photography show, which is only a few days away now. We also explained about lens movements and showcased some of the dereliction photos you sent in. So check that out if you haven't already seen it. If you're new to our channel, then hello. We release shows on the second and final Sunday of every month. These are premiered at 4 p.m. UK time when myself and the team are all available in the live chat window to answer any questions and share a joke or two. It's fun to watch the first viewing with so many of you. So if you're able to join us for those, then we look forward to saying hi online. Now, we recently asked you to send us some of your holiday and travel shots for critique in our surgery. They'll be getting a thorough checkup from today's doctor in the house, our very own Harry Martin. You've been sending in loads of your travel images and we've had a great time looking through them all and seeing where you've been. Now I can't feature all of them of course so I've picked just a few random shots to have a look at. So let's get straight to the first image which is from Jerry Doherty and this was taken in uh, Dumbarton in the south of Scotland. Now first off what hits you about this image is the colour. It's got that quintessential Scottish purple colour which uh, really resonates with me obviously living in Scotland. Um, so that's a real plus point for this image um, as well as the really nice sky that he's managed to capture. There are however a few things that I think he could have improved on uh, at the time of capture. One obvious one being that the image is uh, ever so slightly off level and uh, you can see that it looks like the water is, is draining out towards the left of the image. Now we can correct that um, just by rotating the image in post-production but as you can see, it's going to crop off some elements of the corner of the images and interfere with the composition as a whole. So it's always one important thing to make sure you get correct at the time of capture. For me personally, I think it's been processed more than I would have personally done because it looks like he's captured everything 
at the stage, uh, at the time of capture even. So we've got lovely, beautiful color in the sky. It's exposed well, but the um, increase of contrast that it looks like has gone on has just made the shadows a little bit too dark for me, a little bit too gritty and punchy. So I would have dialed that back just a little bit, but overall a really nice capture of a, of a Scottish sunset. Um, next image is from Ian Knight. Now, um, this is a shot, so he's been clearly watching our silhouettes feature from an earlier show, uh, and it's a fantastic image of uh, Bow Fiddle Rock from the east coast of Scotland. Now, everything's done correctly here. He's captured a really interesting subject, along with a fantastic sky, exposed well for the light and for the sky, and created a really nice silhouette. Now he's actually sent us two versions of the image. One is this one, which is the unedited image. And then we've got an edited version just here. And I have to say, I think the original unedited version is miles better for a couple of key reasons. Um, one, the edited version here has had a slight crop, which I think has lost some of the nice sky, some of these clouds up in the top of the frame. So I would have left it uncropped to begin with. In addition, the shadows have been raised way too far which takes away that feeling of the silhouette and the interest and also starts to show this flare, which is an inevitable part of shooting into the sun. I think he was also using a couple of filters on this image as well, which will compound that problem. Um, so just by lifting the shadows and it's, it's kind of washed the image out. So Ian, I, I think this original shot is miles better and I would leave it pretty much untouched because you, you've nailed everything right at the capture stage there. Moving on, we've got an image from George Taylor from Japan. And this is a really interesting travel shot. Another one shooting straight into the sun. And we can see a little bit of flare going on, but there's not a lot we can do about that. And it, it almost adds to, to this scene and that feeling of, kind of looking into the sun, squinting a little bit. And even though it's shot into the sun, it's well controlled and exposed for both the sky and also the foreground, because we've got a really interesting foreground all of this detail in the stone um, and this uh, pagoda, this temple. Um, so that's a, a, it's been well controlled, well exposed, and overall a really nice travel shot. There's not a lot I can um, critique about it there. Moving on to an image from Mexico, I believe, from Judith. Now, this is a fantastic record shot of somewhere that um, I think she must have obviously eaten on during her travels. These lovely ladies cooking in quite a busy, vibrant kitchen. Um, now, as a photograph, I'd say that the lighting probably is an ideal shot under fluorescent lighting. I would have maybe shot it from a slightly different viewpoint and perspective, trying to get a little bit lower down, maybe closer to all this lovely colour in the foreground and to get to, to the subject's eye level, to the ladies here. However, what it is, is a fantastic record shot. So not every image you take when you're out traveling has to be an amazing, perfect hero shot. And we encourage everyone on any of our trips to take these record shots because quite often, these are the moments you remember most um, and, and it's important to take these shots. And this ticks all the boxes um, and is a really nice example. So well done, Judith, there. Moving on to our final image, which is from Jean and it's from North Carolina. Um, this is a fantastic image of a lighthouse, always a really striking subject. I like the tone, I quite like the processing in this image, it adds to that really dry, hot, arid feeling that I know you must get from living in North Carolina. Um, now one thing, and you can always feel free to disagree because composition is subjective, I like the use of this strong, shadowy silhouette line leading in from the corner of the image here. However, I think I probably will have shot it slightly differently had I been there because we've got this really nice wooden walkway and bridge which has got this fantastic zigzagging line. However, it's coming out of almost the middle of the image here and I would have liked to have seen that as a really strong leading line zigzagging all the way up. And I would have added just a little bit more space above the lighthouse just here just to make it feel a little less claustrophobic. But those are really minor points what's a really nice shot. So again, very nice shot there, Gene. Now, please keep the images coming in. There's always too many to feature, but we'll try and keep the surgeries coming. So send your images through. The email will be in the description below.
Thanks, Harry. And do keep sending us your photos as we love to see what everybody is up to. And you never know, you might see your shot featured on a future episode of Photography Online. Now, if you're a regular viewer of the show, you'll have heard the story about Marcus's lost bag, which ended up along with all of its contents in the sea. At the end of that story, he jokingly requested that if anybody found a camera bag in the North Atlantic to get in touch. Well, guess what? Scott Davidson, a photographer on the Isle of Lewis, sent us this photo after he found it while exploring the coastline. Sadly, the camera and four lenses which were inside are nowhere to be found, but Scott advises us that the bag itself, despite being in the ocean for a year, is still usable. So if you want a bag which can withstand the elements, we have put this one through the ultimate test. When we told Mindshift about the find, they kindly sent Marcus a replacement bag. So we're hoping he's going to be more careful with this one. Thanks to Scott for letting us know and good luck with the sale of the cameras and lenses on eBay, Scott. All right, well, at the beginning of this year, we launched a new feature that we call Just the Two of Us, where one of the team documents their photo adventures by themselves. No camera operator, no sound man, and certainly no hairstylist or catering. We've already followed Marcus into the mountains and Harry up into the Eagles world, so Nick thought he'd invite us along on a recent trip that he did to another remote location. I'm on my way to one of the most remote areas on the Isle of Skye. Now this is going to take me at least two to three hours of hard walking in the very strong winds and at times rain to get there. So while I do that, why don't I tell you why I'm going there? Located at the end of a very remote peninsula like MacLeod's Maidens, a trio of impressive sea stacks which resemble chess pieces. Due to the remoteness of the area, despite living on Sky for almost six years, it's one of the few locations I've yet to tick off my wish list. Being a five hour round hike, this is not somewhere you can easily get to at dawn or dusk, so camping is the best option. My colleagues Marcus and Harry camped here a few years ago, but being the wimps they are, decided to do it in calm conditions. I've seen the shots they got, and to be honest, they suck. So I thought I'd come out here to show them how it's really done. The reason why I'm going to McLeod's Maidens today is because the weather forecast suggested strong winds and nice waves in the sea. So obviously that will work really nice with you've got waves crashing against the sea stacks. Now one of the downsides to this, as I've just mentioned, is the wind. And the overnight winds are look like they're going to be gusting about 40 mile an hour. So that should be rather interesting for me in my tent. I just hope I don't get blown away. Being blown all night long was bound to play havoc with my sleep. But hey, to get the money shot, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. So I've done around two and a half miles now, so that's about halfway. I've got plenty of time before sunset. And uh, yeah, things are looking good so far. I've had a reasonable amount of rain. Now, location I'm going to, the fact that it's raining means that there's uh, plenty of cloud in the sky and that's what I want. I don't want pure blue skies, I want the, the moody atmospheric skies to go with the, the drama which I'm hopefully going to get in the sea. So, I say I've got another two and a half miles to go, steadily going uphill at the moment, so I'll just uh, keep cracking on. One thing which is really important in most landscape photography is planning. If you're going to invest a couple of days in a photo, then you need to be sure you're giving yourself every chance of getting what you want. I had waited a few weeks to get the right conditions I was looking for, which were basically lots of movement in the sea, shown here in purple, and a dramatic sky above. My route took me through terrain which was as varied as the weather. One minute I was in dense woodland or open moorland, carpeted in heather, and the next on elevated and exposed sea cliffs. With the ever-changing light and the views attracting my attention, it was sometimes difficult to stick to the path. So looking at the map, I've got uh, just over a mile to go, I think, now. And uh, it's really nice up here. The, the heather's nice and purple at the moment, carpeting the, the cliff tops here. 
I get, got views of the, the sea. From what I can see at the moment, there's nice movement in the sea and it's not even high tide yet. So hopefully by the time kind of sunset, sunset comes around, there'll be those great waves crashing against the, the sea stacks of the McLeod's Maidens. So not far to go now. One of the many aspects I love about photography is the incentive it provides to do things like this. Without a reason to be going here at dawn and dusk, there's no way I or anyone else would ever likely camp out in conditions like this. But with the stiff sea breeze blowing through my hair and keeping it out of my eyes, I was enjoying being out in the wilderness and was surprised to find myself looking forward to a sleepless night. Being a long way from anywhere, I had to travel relatively light, so I had to make a few sacrifices with the camera gear I brought. Um, I've opted for two lenses, 70 to 200 millimeter, so a medium telephoto lens, and my wide angle lens, which is a 15 to 35. I've also brought some filters. Uh, I was hoping to do some um, long exposure shots, but with it being so windy, not sure. I'll give it a go, but you never know. So I've got some ND filters in there. Now you may have seen uh, previous shows where Marcus and Harry went out on their own shoots and I think Marcus had uh, some pork pies with him for his dinner and his breakfast and Harry had a packet of biscuits and a six pack of beer. Well, not me, I've got my camping stove. I'm a proper camper. I've got my dehydrated food. So I've got pasta bolognese for this evening and I've got some muesli for breakfast. But before I could think about dinner, I needed to pitch the tent. The winds didn't make this easy, but with views of the sea in almost every direction, occasionally bathed in epic light, this was going to be a great location for an overnight camp. Despite being in the middle of the busiest tourist season, I hadn't seen another person all day, so the sense of isolation added to the adventure. So I've got my tent pitch and I'm back at the Maiden's Viewpoint. Got my camera set up, I've been taking a few test shots. I've got the uh, 70 to 200 millimeter lens on, so I'm, I want the Maiden's to be quite big for this shot. There's no real foreground around here, so I'm shooting quite, you know, zooming right into them basically. But I've got a bit of the, the headland in front of them, and I'm using that as a kind of a foreground. Now settings wise, so what I'm doing is I'm, using, I'm shooting at f8, it's a pretty sharp aperture for this lens and I've gone with the, uh, the case polarizer to remove any glare from the surface of the water. And the moment I'm shooting with a three stop ND, that's given me a exposure time of six tenths of a second. Now I think they're coming out sharp. It's quite windy. I found that anything quicker than that, it just wasn't picking up the water in the way that I'd want it to. I will try even longer exposures, but I don't think they'll come out sharp. Just because of the wind, what I'm doing is I'm actually standing, kind of trying to stand in front of the lens like this, because the wind's coming from this direction to try and stop any wind getting at the camera during the exposure. So I'll just keep experimenting with it. Uh, we're still, I think, an hour and a half. Let me just check. Yeah, an hour and a half. Well, now we're 15 till sunset. The, there's quite a lot of cloud in the sky at the moment. There are breaks higher up. You never know, I might get some light coming through. I just keep firing away every now and again, I'll just take a shot now, so again I'll, I'll say I'll stand in front of the, the camera to try and block the wind and I basically look at the sea, see when the waves come in, press the shutter and uh, hopefully get something good. This was the shot at 6 tenths of a second, which is slow enough to convey movement in the water, but short enough to ensure I was able to get a sharp shot free of any wind vibrations. So as you can see I'm back in the tent now, I've had my dinner. I'm just about to get ready for bed. Um, I've got my alarm set for reasonably early to see what I can get at sunrise. As it turns out, the alarm wasn't really needed as the weather made sure I wasn't going to sleep in. But in the end, there was nothing to get up for anyway. So it was simply a case of packing up and heading for home. It's almost two hours after sunrise now. It's extremely cloudy. I'm not going to get any better photographs than I did last night. Now this is definitely a location I will return to at different times of the year when the sun is setting in different positions to the sea stacks. So it's time for me to head off home and while I do that I'll leave you with some of the best photographs I got last night.
I did try some longer exposures using my 6 and 10 stop ND filters. While these are ok, they are not as sharp as the shorter exposures but do give me ideas as to what can be achieved from this location in the future. I returned, content with the photos I had got, but most importantly of all, having had an adventure with my camera. And who can find fault with that? That certainly looked like it defined the term wild camping. We'll be filming more solo adventures with various members of the team over the coming months, so make sure you're subscribed and have notifications enabled so that you never miss a show. Next time you see me, I'll be talking to you from the photography show as we show you what went on over the four days of exhibition. We'll also be showing you how to make the most of the autumnal landscape colours, so apologies to those of you watching in the Southern Hemisphere, just re-watch in six months time. Don't forget that all the links to everything that we've been mentioning today are in the usual place and whether you're one of our supporters or not please feel free to snoop around in our community page where we often post some behind the scenes stuff and let you know what's going on all right well we are out of time again but fear not we are back in just a couple of weeks so you don't need to wait too long for your next photography online fix until then you know what to do take good care but most of all take good photos mm -hmm.